Hi, I'm James Robinson, and this is my stock pick of the week. This is my fifth and final video on the company Intel. Today, we're gonna to talk about the company's wealth creation characteristics. And what I really mean by that is, how good a job does management do in converting the profits the company makes into either A, future profits, B, a higher stock price, or C, direct returns to the shareholders through dividends, for example. So that's what we're gonna look at with this video. Before we go any further, I'd like to suggest that you might follow me on Twitter. My Twitter handle is at Robinson Stocks. Uh, the reason why you'd follow me on Twitter is because when I buy or sell a stock, I don't always get time to, um, to make a video right away. Sometimes it takes me a few days. However, I always post online on my Twitter account, uh, the minute that I buy something, the minute I sell something, I do that so there's a record of what I've done and when I've done it so that I can justify my claims. Um, but I also do it so that those of you who follow my videos can see what I'm doing in real time and make adjustments according to your portfolio should you want to do that. Um, I also will put updates on when there's new trade, when there's new videos available. Uh, if I see news, thoughts, or some article that I think is interesting and stock related, I'll put that on there. I don't put anything on my Twitter account that isn't really stock related, almost exclusively. Every once in a while, something will sneak through, but never political content, for example. Um, also, I'd like to thank all of my subscribers. I've got uh, 283 subscribers. The last time I did uh, a series of videos, uh, I was at 260, so about 23 videos in the last, 23 subscribers in the last month, so thank you very much. I do appreciate it. It's one of the things that keeps me going and doing this. Also, um, if you're right, if you're following me from somewhere around the world, uh, drop me a line, let me know what city you're from. I really like to know where my followers are from. Uh, currently, I've got, I've known followers from 52 cities around the world, and, but I've got 283 subscribers, so some of you are holding out on me. So if you get a chance, just write in the notes, hey James, you know, I'm from Belfast, or wherever you're from, especially if you're from Africa, because I don't yet have any subscribers from Africa, and there's a big hole in the middle of the map with no subscribers, so thanks, I'd appreciate it. So um, I've already done a video on uh, the dividends mm -hmm. for Intel, so that's one of the key ways that a company can return wealth to the shareholders. But we've already addressed that, so we're not gonna talk about that much in this video. Uh, so we're gonna start this video by talking about shares outstanding. So one of the things that a company can do with its profits that directly benefits or maybe indirectly benefits shareholders is they can buy back shares. When a company buys back shares, it means that there are less shares outstanding. In theory, the profit should be the same. So if the same amount of profits are divided over a smaller number of shares, it's a higher allocation of profit for every share. That in turn should mean that the share price should go up proportionately, assuming the company trades at the same PE. Uh, so uh, buying back shares is one of the things management can do to reward shareholders. And we like it when they do that. So you can see here, um, Intel has gone from just under 7 billion shares outstanding to about 4 billion shares outstanding today. That's a fantastic reduction. That's over 20 years. Um, over the last 10 years, it's been about 25% uh, of the stock they bought back. So you can see here, you know, both stocks repurchased each year, and you can see uh, the aggregate how many shares have been bought back. And you know, I give this company you know A plus marks for this. So if you look at this another way, if you'd bought 10% of Intel stock at the end of 2009, you'd own 555 million shares. Um, today, through stock sales, you're 550 through, through stock repurchases, I should say. Your 550 million shares would mean that your ownership in the company has increased from 10% to 12.58%. So that's a 25% increase. So without spending a penny of your own money, you've gone from owning 10% of the company to 12% of the company. It's a 25% increase. That's fantastic. That's real value to you, the shareholder. Uh, even better, your share of the company's earnings would have gone from about $436 million. That's how much the company, that's how much your 10% of the company would have made been worth. 10 years ago, uh, today it's worth $2.65 billion. So it's gone up about five times uh, in the last uh, 10 years. Um, your earnings per share would have gone from 79 cents a share to $4.77 a share. So again, these are fantastic numbers uh, and they do show that the share repurchases do work for the benefit of the shareholders, uh, generally speaking. Now, the one caveat to that is you do wanna make sure you're buying the stock at a good price. So you don't wanna be overpaying for a stock only to find out that you own even more of it and it's worthless. But generally speaking, with the companies I'm looking at, I tend to believe that they're appreciating over time and so stock repurchases tend to make sense uh, over time. 
Another way we can look at a company's uh, management creating of wealth for the shareholders is looking at stockholders' equity. Now, stockholders' equity is a pretty simple thing. You take up all the assets, you subtract off from it all the liabilities, and that's your stockholders' equity. Um, so the stockholder equity uh, in 2009, 10 years ago, was about $40 billion for this company. Today, it's just under 80 million, or 80 billion, I should say. So the, the uh, stockholders' equity has increased, has doubled in 10 years. That's impressive, but remember, when a company buys back shares, that is money that is no longer in the company's coffers. And so that's a reduction in assets. And also when a company pays dividends, those dividends are assets that are being dispersed to the shareholders directly. And that means that this company has managed to double its uh, stockholders equity while buying back 25% of the company and while paying back significant dividends over the last 10 years. So stockholders equity, when looked through that prism, gives you a sense this company's done a really great job, the management has of continuing to build the asset, the value of our business. So this slide is looking at the exact same thing, only instead of looking at it in um, stockholders total equity, we're looking at stockholders equity per share. And you would expect that that number would have gone up more dramatically because there's been uh, so many share buybacks. And in fact, we've gone from you know about $7 in shareholders equity 10 years ago to uh, about 20, so it's almost tripled. So the stockholders equity has doubled, but the stockholders equity per share has tripled. And that's the, one of the benefits of buying back all those shares. Uh, I say this pretty much every time I look at this slide uh, on these videos, but you know the old axiom is it takes money to make money. That's obvious, everybody understands that. But the question is how much money does it take to make money or how much money do you make off the money they take? So the idea here is what's the assets this company has and what's the return that we're getting on those assets? Another way of saying that is how efficiently is this company using the assets that they have retained to create more money for us, the shareholders? Um, and so this slide looks at that and gives you a really good indication of that. So the red line is the top 10% of, I've analyzed about a thousand companies now, and of the thousand companies I've analyzed, what return on assets puts you in the top 10%, it means you're the most efficient of companies. And you can see this company has been significant, always in the top 25% and virtually always in the top 10% of companies. So again, management's doing a fantastic job in creating wealth for us because those assets that they do, you, that they do retain and that they are utilizing are really generating a lot of profits relative to the other companies we might've been able to buy with the same amount of money. This next slide looks at really the exact same thing, but instead of looking at return on assets, we're looking at shareholders' equity. And you see that we're not quite in the top 10% in shareholders' equity. And the reason for that is not that the company isn't performing, it's that the company doesn't have a lot of debt. Remember, total assets is just you add up all the assets you have and you figure out the return on assets for that. Um, this is looking at return on equity, so it's assets minus debt. But Intel doesn't have a lot of debt. And there's a lot of companies that have a tremendous amount of debt. And if you have a tremendous amount of debt, then you don't have very much equity and it's very easy to get a high return on equity uh, because Intel has all those assets and very little debt, it's harder to get a really super high return on equity, especially relative to other companies. So you see here that the return on equity is north of 25%, that's spectacular, but there are companies out there able to get 30% return on, on equity. I don't really mark down the company for that, uh, because I recognize that you know you shouldn't be penalized for not needing a bunch of debt to run your business. One of the things that can uh, make or break a company is the the amount of money that they are retaining and how efficiently they're retaining. I shouldn't say make or break a company. Make or break a company from through my eyes in terms of as an investor. Um, I like companies that don't need a bunch of additional investments every year to keep themselves current. Um, there are some ways that require that. Auto industries, for example, are famous for retaining a bunch of money just to keep producing the product. Uh, Intel's done a very good job with this. They haven't really retained very much money over the last 20 years. I mean, obviously $50 billion is a lot of retained earnings, but in the scheme of the company itself, it's, it's not very significant. And so this is a, this, I give this company high marks for the relatively small amount of retained earnings they're keeping every year to keep the operation going. The really exciting thing about Intel is their return on retained earnings. Now, the, the idea is I don't mind if a company is retaining the money as long as they're using that money to generate greater and greater profits every year. If they're retaining all our money and generating the same amount of profits or less profits, then I look at the retained earnings as being basically wasted. So you look at this stock and you say, wow, these guys are, you know, my goal is that a company can retain 
can create additional earnings at a rate of greater than 10% of retained earnings. This company is blowing that away without any problem at all. Again, I, I, talk, I talk about this when I do these videos that this method isn't the exact, it's not science, it's not exactly a true measure of what's actually happening. It's an oversimplification, but it just gives me a gauge, a barometer that gives me a sense for the company. Mm -hmm. And all I really do is I add up the total amount of retained earnings for 10 years, and I compare that to the total amount of additional earnings they've had over 10 years, and I come up with the ratio of those two numbers. And um, I like to see that number be higher than 10%. Again, in this case, it's far, far higher, so it's spectacular. Uh, but that's really what I'm doing with this slide. So another thing that a company can do that will create you know, value for the shareholders is to retain some cash. Now, this is a bit of a mixed bag. I don't want them to retain too much cash. At some point, they have more money than they need, and they should be returning it to us. Um, but up to a point, additional cash gives the management flexibility to not take on debt, to make it through tough times, to buy other assets or buy other companies that, that might come along. And so I like my companies to have a reasonable amount of cash on the condition that they can justifiably use that cash. On the same token, if a company has too much cash, I'd like to see that come back to me, the shareholder, through mm -hmm. uh, preferably dividends, but also stock repurchases. So with this stock, what's interesting about Intel is you can see that uh, between 2016 and 2019, the amount of cash on hand decreased every year. That's because they were paying it back to us. They were buying back a bunch of shares and they were, um, and they were paying us a bunch of dividends. So that's a good sign. Uh, if it continues to drop over and over and over again below some safety level, I get concerned, but Intel's not at that point. I mean, their cash, the current cash reserves are $13 billion. It's pretty amazing that they have that much cash on hand. What I'm doing with this slide is I'm looking at all of the different tools a manager can do to create wealth for the shareholders or to increase the value of the business, which ought to be reflected in the share price, which ultimately you know enriches the shareholder. So um, I'm looking at this and I'm saying, okay, we can, if we pay down debt, that obviously has multiple ways of creating benefit for the shareholder. It certainly reduces interest payments and the reduced interest payments mean more profit and more profit at the same PE means a higher price. Uh, also having less debt means you have the ability to take on more debt if you need it. Uh, and it means that you're not sort of using up your potential reserves as much as you might. Next thing the company can do is pay dividends. That's pretty self-explanatory. That's an actual direct check to the shareholders. We like dividends. Stock buyback is an indirect way of enriching the shareholders by giving them a larger percentage of the company and in theory, proportionally increasing the share price. Um, the company can increase cash, holding cash, if the company, ca company can use that cash effectively uh, is not a bad thing. Um, so you add all those four things up and you say, okay, what's the total wealth created in any given year? And then uh, what I try and do is say, what is the wealth created over a five year period? because I recognize there'll be years where it kind of goes up and down and it'll fluctuate, but a trend line of what happened over five years gives you a pretty good example. So here you can see that, um, you know, this company has paid back stock pretty much every year. Some years it's gone down in cash, other years it's gone up in cash. But when you add it all up, you can see this company is generating an awful lot of wealth for the shareholders year in and year out. So if you go back through these things and you look at what we've talked about with, um, with the shareholders' wealth creation. The company's bought back shares, that's great. We've talked about the dividends, that's great. The company has doubled the shareholder equity despite buying back shares and the dividends, that's great. The company's uh, shareholder equity has gone up disproportionate to the, uh, shareholders' equity per share has gone up disproportionate because they bought back so many stocks. They're in the top 10% of companies are returning on assets, which I think is an extremely important stat. Uh, they're in the top, almost the top 10% for return on equity, despite having very little debt, which is really exceptional. The company doesn't retain a lot of earnings, has got a fantastic return on retained earnings in terms of new profits that are created through retained earnings. Um, the company's cash and market for security seems to be in balance, they're not hoarding too much, nor keeping too little. And then you look at the total wealth created over a five-year period of time, and for every five-year period of time, it's been a significant amount of money that's been created for the shareholders. So, Long story short, the wealth created for, for Intel is one of the major reasons why I buy, why I would suggest that you should buy this stock. So normally at this point, I would now give an Im some input as to what's been happening with my little portfolio and my own wealth creation efforts. Um, but it's January 5th and the year has just ended and I'm in the process of creating a video to go over my annual results. And so doing so again now would be sort of redundant. 
Um, so I'm not going to do that. So I appreciate you following. I appreciate you um, subscribing and liking and telling me where you're from and all that stuff. And uh, hopefully we all have a great uh, 2021 together. Appreciate it. Bye.